Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at and with Trinity Lutheran Church. We are a Reconciling in Christ congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that welcomes all of God's children to form a community of faith that honors the full spectrum of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation and works for racial equity and economic justice. If you're watching the live stream, you are invited to receive the Sacrament of Holy Communion when you see it received here in the sanctuary. 
Everyone in the sanctuary is welcome to receive communion today. You don't need to be a member of this church or of any church because this is God's table. And if you are feel invited to it, come on down or stay in your seats because you have the option of doing that. You have the option of staying in your seats when it's time to receive communion or of coming up here to the altar rail. If you're staying where you are, you need one of the white paper bags. It contains the bread and wine or bread and juice that you will receive. If you come up to the rail, you need to stop at one of these two tables and get the little container of bread and wine or bread and juice, which is marked with a red dot. The bread is on one side of these things and the liquid is on the other and you need to open the right side first if you don't want to get wet. There are a few ways to tell us that you're here for worship today. There are tablets set up all over the place where you can check in. There's a QR code on the back of the page of the bulletin that you can use with a smartphone. There's probably still a clipboard in almost every pew. And all of these allow you to request regular emails from the church about our activities and events. If you want to have someone mentioned in today's prayers, go to the table at the back of the middle aisle and write their name on one of the post-it notes there. Those notes will then be collected before we offer today's prayers to the people. Friday was Veterans Day. And I want us to start having an accurate list of who among our worshipers is a veteran. So can I just ask, is anybody here today who's in the active reserves? All right. Can I ask the veterans to raise a hand and keep it raised until you hear me say your name? Because then it'll be on tape and we can write it down. Barb McComb, Don Dorr, Jim Tallon. Yeah. I, so who did I miss? Ah, Jerry Munger. Sir, I do not know your name. Joe and Leah. Thank you. Joe and Leah. Oh my goodness, Robert. Anybody I didn't catch? Thank you. I just want us to start keeping track of this so we know. <sighs> yes, yes, sir. And there's that. Thank you for offering your service to this country and the sacrifices you have already made. We are collecting coats, jackets, sweaters, sweatshirts, such items that will help our neighbors stay warm as the days get colder. So raid your closet, raid a thrift store, and bring some things in. Every Wednesday at 9, there's a group from the congregation that gathers for breakfast at the Copper Kitchen on Central Avenue at 56th Street South. On Wednesdays at 11.30, we offer a free lunch here at the church and we always need volunteers to help serve it, you can talk to Jerry, and he will tell you more about that ministry. This week, our online class on prayer will only meet on Wednesday at 3 p.m. It'll only meet in the afternoon this week, when we will be talking about how the prayers that we say during Sunday worship guide and influence the prayers that we offer the other days of the week, I hope. Church Council meets Wednesday, Wednesday, did I say Wednesday, at 6 p.m., this Wednesday. Our food pantry is open on Friday mornings, and we always need volunteers there at 9 o'clock. Lynn is hiding behind a pillar right now, but she's waving her hand, and you can talk to her about that ministry. Are there other announcements that need to be made today? This congregation can't exist without the generous financial gifts of our worshipers. There is an offering plate in the narthex, the entrance area of the church, where you can put donations. You can also use that smartphone and the QR code that's in the middle of the bulletin to make a contribution on our website. Is there anyone celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week? Okay, then I ask you to silence your cell phones and electronic devices and quiet your heart and your mind in preparation for worship.
that you're able to do so, and it's easy to do so, I invite you to stand and face up here in the back of the book. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose love is unconditional and eternal. Amen. Let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and truth, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to light. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our companion and friend, Amen. Beloved of God, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. Continue your journey in love and hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
According to Psalm 98, the day of God's judgment will be a day of joy because it is when God will win a final victory over the forces of injustice and evil. All of the nations of the earth and all of creation will lift up a new song celebrating what God has done. We are encouraged to be noisy in that celebrating. We aren't just a sing for joy, we shout for joy in order to be heard over the noise of the trumpets and horns and over the applause offered by the rivers and seas. The book of Malachi could not be more different in its message of fire and brimstone destroying the wicked and the arrogant. Yet even it tries to offer us words of hope. The second letter to the Thessalonians was written in part to tell people that the end of the world might not come as soon as they were thinking. And in the meantime, there is plenty of work for all of us to do. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus reminds us that temples and kingdoms can fall. There can be all kinds of natural and man-made catastrophes, but God will bring us through all of them with a love that never fails. Let us pray. O oh God, without you, nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Embrace us with your mercy, that with you as our guide, we may live through all that is temporary without losing that which is eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the prophet Malachi. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Sound of the horn, shout with joy. 
second reading is from the second letter to the Thessalonians. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Word of God, word of life. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. 
but if not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Be seated. This temple that is being admired by people in the gospel isn't that one that had been built by King Solomon. That impressive building made of stone, imported cedar and cypress, adorned with gold and bronze, that was completely destroyed by the armies of Babylon when the kingdom of Judah was conquered and the brightest and best of its people were taken into exile. Seventy years after that, the descendants of the exiles were given permission to return and resettle the territory, which was now part of the Persian Empire. The new temple that they built on their return was smaller and simpler than Solomon's. So small and simple that when people compared it to the stories told by their ancestors, the Bible says that they wept. But worship resumed in this simple sanctuary, and for a while, everything was fine. Within just a few years, though, a document was being circulated that condemned what was going on in both the temple and the community. We now know this document as the Book of Malachi. We don't know if Malachi was the name of its author or just his job title, though. The word Malachi means my messenger. And the first verse of the book says, the word of the Lord to Israel by my messenger. The message being delivered is that the priests in the temple are not serving God as they ought. They are not offering the proper sacrifices, and they are not providing teaching and guidance to the people. They are to blame for the fact that the people are sinning against the poor and the vulnerable in their communities, sinning so greatly that they must once again be threatened with God's judgment. According to the book, only a small segment of the population has remained faithful to the God who brought them back from exile. They are the only ones who will receive God's blessing. Everyone else is doomed to a horrible fate. The wicked and the arrogant will be burned to ashes, while the devout people bask in the glow of a rising sun. Years then passed, that day of judgment never appeared, but the Persians who had conquered the Babylonians were in turn conquered by the Greeks, who then defiled the Jerusalem temple with statues of their gods and goddesses. One ruler insisted that he was an incarnation of the divine and that the Jewish people had to worship him. When the people rebelled and then enjoyed a brief time of independence, they rededicated the temple to the worship of God alone, an event that is commemorated every year in the festival of Hanukkah. Then when the Romans conquered Judea, they proclaimed that a corrupt and ambitious name, man named Herod was now king of the Jews. Herod maintained his control with violence and ruthlessness and the full military might of Rome. He had hundreds of citizens and even members of his own family killed. He was feared and hated. In order to gain favor with the people of Judea, 
Herod organized a massive expansion of and improvement of the old temple complex, doubling it in size. Its new courtyard could, and often did, hold 400,000 pilgrims who came in from all over the empire. The new construction was decorated with massive blocks of white marble, blue, scarlet, and purple tapestries made of linen. The doors were gold-plated. The gates sparkled with silver and gold. The work was funded by heavy taxation of the people. Herod said the temple was rebuilt for the glory of God. Most people understood it was for the glory of Herod. But it was an impressive sight. This was the temple that Jesus of Nazareth visited a number of times in his life. His last visit resulted in his arrest, execution, and resurrection. And 40 years after that visit, the city of Jerusalem and its glorious temple were once again completely destroyed, this time by the Roman army. The only stones left standing on top of one another were the ones now known as the Wailing Wall. This was a traumatic event for all of the Jewish people. No, no matter where in the empire they lived, the core of their identity had once again been cut out of them. It was also traumatic for the earliest Christians, who had continued to worship in this temple for as long as they lived near the city. All four of our Gospels were written very soon after and partially in response to the horrifying destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. Mark's Gospel presents it as a sure sign of the imminent end of the world. Luke's Gospel, which we read today, it's a little more cautious, warning us against those who claim that the end is near. Did Jesus predict the destruction of the temple would happen? It's possible. It's more likely that he warned his followers that all kinds of difficult things lay ahead. And some of his general warnings were remembered as specific predictions. Jesus' words to us are the same. Don't place value in things that can and will be lost. Wars and earthquakes and plagues will happen. Don't freak out. Just be ready to testify, even in the midst of hardship and catastrophe, to God's love and faithfulness. If you make a commitment to God's values, it might bring you into conflict with your family, your community, your society as a whole. People will make your life difficult. They might even kill you. But in the grand scheme of things, not one hair on your head will really perish. Good news for some of us. Not one hair is going to perish. Your faithful endurance is what will preserve your soul. As in the Gospel of Luke, the second letter to the Thessalonians is a text that cautions against thinking that the end of the world is imminent. And that's why a lot of scholars think it wasn't actually written by the Apostle Paul. Because his authentic letters, the ones the scholars say really were written by him, they were all written before the Gospels. They were all written with a real conviction that the world could end any day now, and that Jesus was returning very, very soon. And that's why Paul was so passionate about rescuing people from their false religions and bringing them into God's family before it was too late. Well, it's now 2,000 years after Paul's letters were written, 
So 2 Thessalonians has a message that rings true to us. The often misused words that if you don't work, you don't eat, are aimed at members of the Christian community who could have been gainfully employed but were unwilling. The passage had absolutely nothing to say to those who cannot work, who cannot find work, who are denied work. And in a day when people can work full-time jobs and even multiple jobs and still not provide for themselves and their families, we need to be real careful about taking any verses out of their context. In the case of all these vulnerable people, Jesus' command for us to be generous, the one we heard just last week, that's still binding. Second Thessalonians condemns people who could be working and bringing to the con congregation contributions that could then be given to the poor. But instead, they are sitting around, meddling in other people's work, waiting for Jesus to come back and judge the world, and thinking that the church should provide for them while they sit around and wait. In our lifetime, Christians have misused some of the images of judgment and destruction in the Bible to argue that really there's no point in us caring for creation or worrying about injustice because God is going to destroy everything anyway. If there's war in the Middle East, well, that's good because that will speed up the second coming of Jesus and this supposed rapture that's going to rescue all the people of faith. To those people and to all of us today, regardless of our level of ability or level of employment, the second letter to the Thessalonians says, please don't sit around waiting for the end of the world. We have work to do. God entrusted the care of creation to us, and it's not too late for us to undo some of our abuse. God entrusted us with care for the poor and the weak, and with the task of working to make God's justice a reality for all people. So as we wait and watch for the joyful day, when God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity, we are to stay busy in both good times and bad, loving and caring for one another, never growing weary in doing what is right. Amen? Amen. <laughs>
Jesus to judge the living and the dead is good news to be celebrated, then that's the faith I invite you to confess using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of the heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. United with your saints in all times and places, we pray for our shared world. Reviving God, keep your church active in its mission and ministry. Give us courage and fill us with wisdom and endurance for challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Renewing God, make us mindful of the ordered beauty of your creation. Help us care for what you have made. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Receive our prayer. Healing God, your people cry out to you. Let the sun of righteousness rise with healing for all who are sick or suffering in any way, <clears throat> especially Phil and Diane Hinton, Olivia Jackson, Vicki Clark, Eileen P., Leilani Mendelham, Anne Stefankowicz, Barb Hahn, Noreen Smith, and all those we bring before you now. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Uniting God, draw us together in mission and ministry for the sake of the world. Guide us as we work to proclaim and demonstrate your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayer. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let's share signs of that peace with one another and with the world that is in such desperate need of peace.
supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me.
gathered into one body by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites you to this table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Please be seated. The ushers will tell you when to come forward for communion, if that's what you're going to do. If you're going to stay in your seats, get that kit out, figure out which side is the bread side, and peel the cover from that side. It is the body of Christ given for you. <coughs> Turn the kit over, peel the cover on the other side, it is the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you're able to do so, as it's easy to do so, I invite you to stand to receive God's blessing. The God of peace, who creates all things and calls them good, who makes us alive in Jesus, and who breathes on us the spirit of hope, Bless you, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 